Take our Bibles at this time and turn to John 1. We read this evening from the testimony of John, beginning at verse 19. Through verse 36, the testimony of John the Baptist. John 1 19, God's testimony through the testimony of John. Now, this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? That would be the prophet from Deuteronomy 18. And he answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? That we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. As the prophet Isaiah said, now those who were sent were from the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who, coming after me, is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Again the next day, John stood with two of his disciples, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Thus far we read the testimony of John, God's word, the gospel of Jesus Christ. By the angel of the Lord who announced the birth of John, it was said that John the Baptist would be great and great in the sight of the Lord. <clears throat> this time, uh, early off, on and off in John's ministry, it might indeed appear as if the angel's prophecy of John's greatness was being fulfilled because he was gathering a, a following. And he was one who was in the wilderness. Remember, children, we know of John, and he certainly looked like a prophet and talked like a prophet and ate locusts like a prophet and dressed like a prophet and seemed to have the authority of a prophet or maybe even someone like the Messiah or Elijah of old. And so people were coming out to him. And people of all stripes, of sinners of all stripes, and he was preaching to them of the kingdom of God and calling them to repent. The kingdom, he said, is at hand. And at one point in his ministry, even, the Jews themselves from Jerusalem sent a delegation of priests and Levites, as our text says, and they wanted to see what this country preacher was all about. And so they asked him who he was, and he confessed that he was not the Christ, nor the prophet, nor Elijah. The other ones they saw would, would come, or they thought would come in the fullness of the time at some point. He was not those things. And <clears throat> so he pointed away in all of these things from himself. And now, however, in our text, when we see John... <clears throat> pointing to Jesus who comes the next day after that delegation had been with him and saying, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now we see the greatness of John. And the greatness of John was that he gets to point out the Messiah. And that's why Jesus would call him the greatest of all the Old Testament prophets. 
and would call him someone who was worthy of the name of an Elijah who always pointed to God and the glory of God. And this John was doing here when he prophesied this remarkable prophecy, Behold, the Lamb of God. And in this, when he's pointing not to himself but to Jesus, he's fulfilling the other thing that the angel said to him and fulfilling this, this and, and, and showing this greatness that would be about him by turning many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. You find that in Luke chapter 1. That's what John's doing. He comes and he's a forerunner of Jesus, and he turns everybody who's gathered to see him to another, even Jesus. And this is what I pray will be the result of this sermon tonight. That many will be turned to Jesus, and having been turned, will say to others as well, Behold the Lamb of God, even my Jesus, who takes away the sin of the world. So let's behold the Lamb of God tonight, shall we? Shall we do this afresh? I think sometimes these symbols of Jesus' sacrifice can, can fall on deaf ears. We've heard them so much. But maybe, maybe afresh. Shouldn't that be our prayer as we hear this sermon? Afresh we're going to hear of the Lamb, the Lamb of God, who takes away my sin, your sin, and the sin of the world. So we want to see how he is eminently qualified to be this Lamb of God, then we want to see that his is the great sacrifice. And then what we mean and what John means by the word behold. We are called to behold him. Jesus is the Lamb of God. And basically this means he is the Savior from sin. John of the priestly family of uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth was conversant, and all the Jews were conversant with lambs and how they were symbolic of this sacrifice for sin that propitiated God and provided atonement, even symbolically in the Old Testament. So when John points out Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, this symbolism would not have fallen on deaf ears or ignorant ears. The people would, would get it after a fashion, and we certainly did. That's the, the theme of the text. Jesus is the one, as a lamb of God, who provides atonement for sin. Now, it is striking how in this very chapter, John the qualifications are brought out through John the Baptist and through John the Apostle, who writes the book of John, of the Messiah. Look, for example, at John's, uh, John the Baptist's word in verse 23. He identifies himself not as the Christ or Elijah or the prophet, but he says, I am the one, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said in chapter 40. And what John is saying there is that he's the forerunner of the Lord. And then when he says and points out Jesus, the Lamb of God, he's identifying Jesus with the Lord himself. He's saying something about Jesus that points to the preeminence of his qualifications. There's divinity about him. He's preparing the way of the Lord. He's the, the voice of one who's going to point people to the Lord. And there he does in person. John the Baptist points to the Lord who is the Lamb, the Lamb of God who is the Lord. Jehovah, as John the Apostle would point out in so many other places. This is one reason I find that connected with the prophecy of John, of Jesus as the Lamb of God in verse 29, is also verses 31 and, uh, 30 and 31, 
which speak of this, the preeminence of Jesus. It says, this is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. The idea there is that John is pointing to the preeminence of Jesus as the one who had existence even before John. Not just he comes after uh, he, he is before John in time, but he has this existence in the plan of God, in the whole purpose of God before the foundation of the world. He's the one, John is saying. And with John's pointing up the divinity of the Savior, his uniqueness as the eternal one, and as the Lord, whose way he was preparing... John the Baptist is agreeing with John the Apostle in chapter 1 and verse 1. For John had already said of this lamb, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So this lamb who's the Lord and who has this eternal existence is also described in John as the Word of God and God the Word. And in verse 3, the Creator, for all things, John says, were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made, and in him was life, and the life was the light of men. So you have here the supreme qualification of a Savior, of any Savior who will deal rightly with the justice of God. He must be divine. The Savior must be God the Savior. And all of the prophecies of God, the Savior of Israel, must come uh, to reality in some way, in some form, in some revelation. And here, when John says, Behold the Lamb of God, and describes him in this way, in this preeminent character and divinity, is saying, Behold your God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is the kind of Savior we need. This is the kind of Savior you need, and I need, and any sinner needs, because our sins are sins against God. They're not just crimes against humanity. They're sins against the living God. And if we would be saved from sin and its wages, which is death, at the hands of the just and holy God, God must be there saving and we have this voice of one crying in the wilderness in the New Testament, and the entire testimony of the New Testament, Behold, Jesus, your God, Emmanuel, Savior, Lamb. He must be a man. He is a man, obviously. He must be a man to save as well. And that Jesus, we know, is. John points him out. He's there walking. Points him out. He's there talking among the people. And we know Jesus in his humanity. But this brings up a question. If Jesus is this one who's man, who has to substitute for human sinners and bear their sin, how can he do that? If everyone born of Adam is born in sin, and if everyone born of Adam therefore needs a sacrifice for their sin and can't very well be offering a perfect sacrifice to God, if they have this dirt of original sin and original guilt, how can that be? How can it be if Jesus is one who is born of Adam, this Word made flesh who dwelt among us, if it's true, as Paul says, and it is, Romans 5, 12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death sped to all men, because all sinned, how can it be? If Jesus is a man, that he saves sinners. Well, it can be simply this way. He's not born of a man. He's born of the Holy Spirit. 
God's so wonderful and wise, isn't he? Read Luke chapter 1, verse 35, I believe. He's conceived by the Holy Spirit. So he's the perfect lamb. Has to be that way, doesn't he? In fact, that's exactly the qualification of the Lamb of God. And the figure of the Lamb of God in the Old Testament sacrifices, the Lamb had to be perfect, without blemish. You read of that in Leviticus 4, 32 and following. Here the priest who makes atonement for sinners, if he brings a lamb as his sin offering, he shall bring a female without blemish, and he shall lay his hand on the head of the sin offering and kill it as a sin offering at the place where they kill the burnt offering. The priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger, put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering, and pour all the remaining blood at the base of the altar. He shall remove all its fat, as the fat of the lamb is removed from the sacrifice of the peace offering, then the priest shall burn it on the altar according to the offerings made by fire to the Lord. So the priest shall make atonement for his sin that he has committed it, and it shall be forgiven him. But the lamb had to be without blemish, without blemish and pure. Well, Jesus was that, wasn't he? And the Bible speaks of this. For example, Peter, in 1 Peter 1, reminds us in verse 18 that we know that we're not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but you are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Had to be. Jesus had to be divine, had to be this man in the place of sinful men, but a perfect substitute without blemish, without spot, without original guilt and corruption or any actual guilt or corruption. Not surprising then that when John in his epistle in 1 John 3 and verse 5 speaks of the purpose of the incarnation, he says this, and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. So right away the Apostle John in his letter reminds us of the sinlessness of Jesus and therefore of the eminent qualification that he be the perfect substitute for us sinners. So he's this pure Lamb of God, this great God of God, and then one other thing, he's authorized, he's authorized. That is, he's ordained to this. He's called in our text, the Lamb of God. And he's called that <clears throat> in distinction from all the other lambs, all the other bulls, and all the other goats whose blood was shed as a prefiguring of his own bloodshed. But he is that, though. He's the culmination of all those sacrifices. They all pointed to his. John is speaking here of, with great weight, pointing out Jesus as the end of all of that other blood, the history of the bloodshedding of Israel in the Old Covenant. And there was a lot of it. And even before Israel was formed, this is how God was showing that this is the way, the sacrifice of a perfect lamb, this is the way back into his good favor. You have, for example, even in the garden, Adam and Eve, when they were received into favor with God, they were given skins of animals. We don't know what animal's blood was shed there, but someone, someone's blood had to be shed. So they were covered by that symbolic of their covering the sin of the covering of their sin. And then you have Abel's sacrifice of the firstlings of the flock. We don't know if it was lambs, but certainly it was understanding something that had been written into the consciousness and the revealed to Adam and Eve and to the ones after them. There had to be this bloodshed if people were going to worship God rightly. And so Cain's offering is not accepted, not just because he was, um, he, 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 uh, his attitude was wrong, but because his, his sacrifice was wrong. 
And so you have, for example, the great type of Christ, uh, the lamb being um, offered in our place in, in Abraham. And you have uh, that ram being caught in the thicket so that Isaac did not have to perish. And, and this was vital for the typology and the prefiguring of the lamb, the ram that Jehovah would provide, Jehovah Jireh would provide and see to providing in the fullness of the time. But then Israel, what a people of the lamb, of bulls, the blood of bulls, the blood of goats, and the blood of lambs, and all over the place. Exodus 12, there you have the calling that there be the blood of a lamb shed, and then it applied this blood on the doorposts and on the, on the, 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 the threshold of the households of God so that the angel of death would pass them over and not kill them all. And so you have that Passover, which was just about to be celebrated in John's gospel at this time, and Jesus being alluded to as the real Passover lamb. And, and you have the daily sacrifices, morning and evening, of a lamb without spot in the temple for the sins of the people. These things Jesus is. He's the lamb. He's the sacrifice, the way back to God. So singular is Jesus. John says in Revelation, in chapter 13 and verse 8, He's the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, the foreordained Lamb. There's never been any other Lamb on God's mind except the Lamb, His Son, Jesus. That's the qualifications He has. And his sacrifice, let's talk about that. Perfect sacrifice. John says, he takes away the sin of the world. Get my... The word take away means take away. It's used maybe hundred times in the New Testament for all kinds of things. One place it's used is with regard to the taking away of the stone that covered the entrance of Jesus' tomb. Take away. So when John speaks of the atonement that Jesus would provide, he's saying that this is a taking away of sin and the taking away of the sin of the world so that it simply is no more. It's as if it were never there. It's not there anymore to condemn all those for whom Jesus took the sin away. There's no more sin. It's amazing that the psalmist in Psalm 103 would say that, as far as east is from west, so he hath removed, taken away our sins, our transgressions from us. That's a psalmist. Before Jesus was by hundreds of years. But here, John is saying, Jesus takes away the sin of the world. Amazing. And what he's saying here is that Jesus takes away the condemning power of sin so that there's no condemnation. That's what's writ on the cross of Calvary. But I go ahead of myself. John's saying that Jesus, this Lamb of God, takes away the sin of the world. When does that occur? I believe the tense here in the Greek language allows us to say that Jesus is taking away now, as he's come. And as apparently he's already been commissioned by John, uh, having been baptized by him, he's on the mission of taking away the sin of the world. He's taking it away. He's bearing the wrath of God for sinners. And he's taking it all away. But then, of course... Principally, this is a taking away of the sin 
of the world on Calvary's tree. And it's so very important that we understand that. That's the central event of the sacrifice of the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, the thing that we must know, that every congregation must know, that every preacher must preach, that every sinner must believe if he would be saved, Jesus Christ crucified. This is the event to which John is pointing here. Behold, the one of the cross. Now, as we'll see later, I'm not even sure John really understood that. I don't think he did. But this is what we know in light of what's happened. In light of Jesus crucified, not long after that, Jesus Christ crucified for our sins. So that's what happens on the cross. There's this amazing taking away of sin so that all for whom that sin is taken away have now the right to be with God. And that's a remarkable thing, you know, because that means already 2,000 years ago, before you were born, there was this event that was for your salvation. And my salvation, it already occurred was then and there, if the cross means anything. It's not something, you see, that waits for anything else to happen. John is saying, he takes away the sin of the world. And it doesn't even wait for us to believe it. It's there. There is a kind of peace with God, a reality of redemption on the cross. Otherwise, these words don't mean anything if they don't mean everything. Jesus takes away the sin of the world on Calvary. And you'll note there, it's sin. Not sins of the world, but sin. And commentators have wrestled long and hard with why it's singular there. I would just present to you certainly something that's biblical, that the idea here is that all that sin is and does to prevent us from being with God is then and there taken away in principle in all of its power and its condemning right, as it were, to hold us to pay the wages Jesus took away the tyrant, the tyrant of the devil, sin, and it's right to hold us to pay to the last farthing. That's what happened on the cross. There is this covering. There is this propitiation, this pleasing of God, as we'll see presently. That's what happened on the cross. So that there is Peace with God made for all for whom Jesus died. Now think of that. And then I go to the next part of this answer and explanation. Of the Lamb of God taking away the sin of the world. And the answer to the question, when did this occur? Well, when this occurs is also when we believe. So there is a taking away of sin and this objective, as it were, peace with God that is accomplished on Calvary. That's redemption accomplished. It's finished. That's what he said on the cross. You believe that? You believe the cross? That's the taking away of sin there. And now, just as important and part of the plan of God is that that redemption that's accomplished gets applied to our account so that there is this taking away of sin and sins for us personally so that the peace that's over there now becomes our possession personally. That's why Romans 5.1 is so pertinent here. 
Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And our sins, plural, are taken away. And that is on the basis of what was accomplished. And we're not therefore adding to what was accomplished, but we're simply receiving that into our hearts, this redemption applied. There's even more. Jesus Christ takes away the sin of the world and our sins every day. Every day. That's why he left us with the prayer, Lord, or our Father in heaven, forgive us our debts. And we're to pray that daily, even as we pray for daily bread, daily forgive us our debts, sometimes hourly. Forgive me again and again. Take away my sin again and again. There's peace with God there. I have peace with God. I'm not going to fall out of justification. God's not going to change the verdict. Something's been established. And something's been given by God. But I get dirty in this life. And so do you. In all of this, we... We're not reading into the text, but we're reading from the text in light of the rest of the New Testament. It says things like 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. In verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is that to which I'm referring. That third aspect of the taking away of sin. It's on the cross. It's when God gives the Holy Spirit and faith and we are justified by faith. And then it's daily as we believe and confess our sins and he cleanses us daily of our iniquities and forgives us daily the debt that we accumulate as the Heidelberg Catechism reminds us. So this is all the one who takes away the sin of the world. What a mediator. And it's of the world. Now there's been no little controversy about that phrase, the Lamb of God is the one who takes away the sin, hamartia, the transgression of the world, cosmos, ha cosmos, the world. Some say, universalists, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, is so gentle and so mild, and that's really what they would emphasize, the gentleness and mildness of the Lamb of God. He's so gentle and mild that he takes away the sin of everyone, and everyone is saved. Has to be if he takes away their sin. And so, with that theory, we would, of course, do away with that right away. The Bible is not a universalistic gospel. There is hell, and God prepares hell for the wicked. And we're not those who believe that this text or other texts like it teaches that there is no such thing as hell. There cannot be any such thing as hell. Maybe there was for a little while before Jesus came, and now there can't be because he takes away the sin of the world. And, or maybe there's hell just for a little while, even now. But after that, because he takes away the sin of the world, there can't be hell forever. And with that, they would contradict the entire New Testament and the very theology of the holiness of God. God's justice requires that the soul that sins dies or substitute dies in his place. And when the substitute dies in his place, when Jesus dies in the place of one, then God requires no more payment. It's made. And all the ones for whom he died, therefore, must be saved. Some like to say that Jesus died for the sins of everybody, for head. He's just waiting for us to believe. And so that his atonement and its effect, these are the Arminians, 
who were combated at the Synod of Dort. The atonement and its effect, they weighed upon the faith and the believing of the sinners, so that there's an atonement accomplished for everybody, but it simply doesn't get to everybody because everybody does not believe, and in fact, most don't. And so, for a large part, the blood of Jesus was shed in vain. Now that, of course, we would not want to hold on to because Jesus is precious to us. And we believe that, as he says in John 10, he lays down his life only for the sheep, and not everyone's a sheep. Matthew 25 says, at the end of time, there's sheep and there's goats. And the goats are separated from the sheep, and the goats go to hell. And Jesus didn't die for them, and they showed this all their life. So it's a just judgment of God upon sinners. It's not an ogre who casts sinners into hell. It's a just judge who casts sinners into hell. So how do we explain this? It's very simple, really. Really, if we would stop eisegeting, that is, reading into texts, to find whatever we want to say there and then say it says it. If we would stop doing that and instead let the text and the context and words that John uses like world speak for themselves. For example, let's turn to John and chapter 11 in verse 50 through 52. This is what I believe John is referring to here. <clears throat> this is the prophecy of Caiaphas, that remarkable prophecy that we've been considering in our Bible study. Verse 49 of John 11, one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. Now this he said, or he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And then verse 52, and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. This is the world that John is referring to. This is the world of Jew not only, but also Gentile. That's what's being referred to by the concept world. It's not everyone head for head, but it's the world, say, in heaven, Revelation 9. We talked about this last Sunday. It's the world of Jew and Gentile from every nation, tribe, and tongue, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And there they are in heaven, Revelation 5, verse 9, and chapter 7 as well. They're all together. They're all happy together. And they're not fighting. And they're showing this, and this is why John uses the word world here. It's not just to get us to think, but it's to get us to glory in the grace of God. John is all about saying Jesus is not just the Savior of the Jews. He's a Savior of God's people everywhere, chosen, redeemed, and who will be in heaven praising God forever. That's why John, in 1 John, also says that Jesus is the propitiation, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. My little children, he says, 1 John 2, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he's the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. John the Apostle is expanding the sight of the Jews, as he would, as Jesus would with Nicodemus. Remember he said to Nicodemus, you're a leader of the Jews, and you under, don't understand you have to be born again to be saved? It's not just that you're born of Abraham. And that's where Jesus in John 3.16 says, God so loved the world, that whosoever believeth might not perish, but have everlasting life in him. So, Jesus and John, they're together on this mission. Yes, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, John's going to turn many of the children of Israel to Jesus, but also to forecast what Abraham long ago knew, that there would be this international community called the world of nations. 
a world of the love of God, a world of heaven, and the world that will lead the way, praising God forever. You see, Jesus takes away the sin of the world, and God is pleased. That's what 1 John 2 means. He's the propitiation, the God-pleasing sacrifice. If God was, is pleased, that means that world is favored now by God. And that world, God's chosen ones who will believe, indeed, is going to heaven. This is the worth of the sacrifice. You believe that? John calls us in his epistle, in the Bible everywhere, to believe and behold the Lamb of God with all our understanding and with all our faith. Do you? This is my final point. There's this lamb preeminently qualified. He is the lamb of God. There is this salvation that's absolutely perfect, perfect atonement for a whole world of sinners. It's not for great people, for sinners. The one thing that characterizes them all is that they have no more sin. It's taken away. Redemption is accomplished for them. It's applied to them. It's received by them in answer to prayer, daily prayer. And they're so happy. They're happy to believe these things. You know, as I said before, it is a question whether John really understood this. Later on, in fact, in prison, John will say, to the disciples, can you ask this Jesus, are you the one who's coming, or should we look for another? Imagine that. Here's John, the forerunner of Jesus, and you think he has all his theology straight, and you think he would, he would have preached a sermon just like this, like Reverend Dick is on the other side of Pentecost, but he doesn't get it. You see, because he's before Pentecost, and he's before Jesus died, and he's before the Spirit is poured out, and all of the other disciples as well, they're, they're just as clueless just about as he is. And they're constantly befuddled over this fact that Jesus has to be more than a prophet and more than a king and more than a priest, even a sacrifice. They don't get it. And when Jesus comes to Peter and announces that he has to suffer and die at the hands of the Pharisees and the third day rise again, he's rebuked by Peter. Far be it from you, Lord, he says in Matthew 16. And Jesus then, of course, says, get thee behind me, Satan. He has to die. He's the Lamb of God. But I wonder... And though the eyes of the understanding of the apostles was wide open at Pentecost and after that, and they could not get enough of preaching and hearing Christ crucified, I wonder if, of, if us and the church in general on the other side of Pentecost, 2,000 years after this, behold, if we've largely forgotten and kind of befuddled ourselves in this world with confusion, ignorance, and simply a lack of appreciation for Jesus, the Lamb of God. Has that happened to you? I'm not talking theologically. I think you are all got your theological ducks in a row. I'm glad that you like theology and you see the importance of it so that it's a way that we can know the truth that sets us free. And many of the lies about the atonement in the Lamb of God lead many people astray, not only theologically, but practically. We need the truth. And then after the truth, we need more truth and then after that, we need more truth. What about our believing that? That's my question. Precious, Peter says, is 
the truth of the gospel of the crucified Savior to those who believe. Is he precious to you? That's the first fruit of believing Jesus is your lamb and the lamb who takes away the sin of the world and of, and of you and of me. Is Jesus precious to you? I mean, how precious? So that his word is, is everything to you? His word, cover to cover, it's all about Jesus. It's all about the word to come, the lamb to come. It's all about the preordained lamb, the prefigured lamb, the lamb who really came, who really died, who really rose again. Is it precious to you? Do you drink it in like milk that babes drink in from mother's breast? You drink it in. That's your natural inclination, or is it the last thing? What's Jesus become to us? He's not changed, but what has he become to us in our mind? We're so distracted in this world. John says, behold the Lamb of God. And, and the second time he says it, you notice this in verse 36 and following. He's, he's saying, behold the Lamb of God. And then finally, he's succeeding in his mission. Two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Two disciples of whom? Of John. No one was following Jesus at that time, apparently. They were following John. But John's mission, you see, was to say, follow him, and he must increase and I must decrease. And so when he said, behold, and he said, behold, the second time, then those two disciples, they heard John, they believed him, and Jesus began to be precious to them. You see, because there was something about Jesus infinitely superior to John. And that's exactly what John wanted about it. He didn't want a following. But how about us? John says, behold. We say, no, wait a minute. i got to check my iPhone. God, John says, behold. God says, behold. The Bible says, believe. And we say, hold it a second. I'm busy with the things on my favorite college basketball team. And on and on and go, it goes, the distraction. And you see, faith is evidenced in the time that we spend with God or not. It's in the little things that characterize our day or not. It's in what we're sowing and what we're reaping. Oh, I know. Well, you say, Domini, I'm, I'm busy with my work and I, I can't just be praying all the time. I understand that. But is your work serving you to serve God or is work a master? Is your leisure serving you to serve God or is it a master? Is sin doing anything that you think could actually help you? Of course not. Who is your master? This is the question I want to leave you with. Behold, do you behold? And then the command, behold him anew. Because you see what happens. is such a blessing as we behold God. And this is the greatest thing. And this is exactly what your pastor wants for you that you may know the cleansing blood of Jesus in every area of your life. You behold him, won't you? Because I want what's best with you. Your elders want what's best with you. Your deacon does. Your, all the people in the congregation do, and God does. So that we behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of your marriage, the sin of your past, the sin of your fumbling around, the sin of the messes you make, the sin of all the things you've done, the, thin, the sin of your blowing it again and again. Behold Jesus, who takes away all that sin. He's real. Salvation is in him. Rejoice. Behold, your lamb has come. And he's coming again. We're glad for that, too, of course, because then we get to be with all of those 
strange creatures of revelation, but also those by grace forgiven creatures of revelation. And we'll say with them with a loud voice and myriad and ten thousands of ten thousands of people, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And you know that the greatest thing about heaven will be this. The centerpiece is the throne of God and of the Lamb. And all of us there serving God and praising God because the Lamb is our Lamb. And the Lamb is coming again as the Lamb Lion of the tribe of Judah. And finally... All this sinful world will be gone and will be taken to heaven. Amen and amen. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would bless us with a vision of the Lamb and a wonderful, wonderful joy in him. Bless us, Lord, with faith Give us to see beyond what we can see by faith. Give us to behold that one whom John pointed out, whom you have revealed as your son, the brightness of your glory, the express image of your person, the Lamb of God. Give us, Lord, now as we go our ways to follow the way taking up our cross to follow that lamb wherever he leads, wherever, wherever he would have us. And Lord, then, we'll be found in the power of the Holy Ghost, baptized in the Holy Ghost, the powerful God-anointed lives, overcoming sin in the whole world with the great courage of the faith of Jesus who said, Come. Follow me. Amen.